Hello everybody, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and for a while now I've been making videos about Germany's ongoing quest to replace the Panavia tornado. Some of these videos might be familiar to you, you might have seen them in the past and the two options that are currently on the table for the German government that are being discussed are the uh, Super Hornet and Growler combo jumbo as well as buying more Eurofighters, preferably also with a new electronic warfare suite. Now, on those videos that I've made, sometimes I get comments like, well, instead of you know, the Super Hornet or the Eurofighter or even the F-35, why doesn't Germany just buy, oh, I don't know, the Rafale or the Gripen or, well, you can insert your favorite plate right here, right? And I've been looking for a while now for a way of tackling this question. And then the last video happened, why Germany doesn't buy the F-35. And all of you have given me a perfect layup for this because I've got so many good suggestions on that video about what plane Germany should consider at the moment, in your opinion. And there have been really some fantastic suggestions here. And this really gives me now a great pool of options to discuss with you. Now, a very kind viewer collected all of the options that were given in the comment section for a period of seven days post-launch of the video, and he's combined them here in a nice little graph. Now, he went through a couple of thousand comments uh, to get uh, roughly 500 uh, suggestions. So thank you very much to him for doing this when I saw uh, the, the potential here that we could have a discussion on all the options that you have shared. I certainly was very happy to uh, take his data set on board. Now, I think there were a really a few good mentions, so thank you all for contributing to this. Because yeah, like I said, this now gives me the perfect opportunity to discuss this topic with you and really show what sort of awkward spot Germany is in at the moment. Because a lot of the suggestions that you've been bringing to the table, well, they're good suggestions, they're good aircraft, but they simply are not what Germany really needs or they're simply not a realistic option for Germany at the moment. And that really shows you how difficult this question is for the German government and the defense ministry in particular. So let's look at these options that you've provided first. As you can see from this graph, there are about 500 suggestions that were given and they're nicely bundled up here. I am going to be omitting some of the more courageous entries like the ME262, the BF109 or the Super Tucano. And I'm also going to be combining some of the options, for example, uh, the Chinese and the Russian aircraft into their respective categories into in one go, uh, simply because that allows me to tackle them in, in, in one pass, essentially. Okay, so now that we have something to work with, I'm going to go through this list from the bottom to the top. But before I do that, it's very important to consider what Germany actually needs at this point, because if we don't consider what they require out of an aircraft, then this list really isn't much help to us. Now, Germany, as you know, needs to replace roughly 40 to 50 Panavia Tornado IDS, that's interdictor strike, so just a strike package ground attack, as well as about 15 Tornado ECRs, which are the electronic war uh, warfare variant. And to do that, so they need an aircraft that can do, uh, that can fulfill a strike role, that can fulfill reconnaissance, seed, and as well as that, they also want something that is able to carry the American B-61 nuclear bomb because Germany, of course, is in NATO's nuclear sharing policy, which means that theoretically, in times of need, hopefully never, they might be carrying uh, American nuclear uh, warheads into battle. So only options that realistically tick all those boxes work for Germany. Of course, it's a lot more complex than that, but those are sort of the main criteria that I'm going to work with in this video. At the same time, you want to keep the number of different airframes in the force to an absolute minimum, simply because that is preferential in terms of supply and maintenance logistics uh, chains. And as well as that, of course, you want to use synergies where possible between the different airframes, uh, simply because, again, that is easier for maintenance. Uh, there you have parts commonality, for example, but you also have ease of transitioning between the different platforms. For example, this is also why an updated Eurofighter in an ECR role, so an electronic warfare role is, although it's going to be quite expensive to develop this, uh, still a discussion uh, that is being had in the German government. Of course, also Airbus wants it to happen, so that's not a reason. But uh, because at that point, the Luftwaffe can turn around and say, right, we have Eurofighter as a fighter, we have Eurofighter in a swing role with a strike potential, and we have Eurofighter as well in an electronic warfare platform. And it's just one plane that gives us all those capabilities, of course, in different variants, but you will have that, that capability. Super Hornet and Growler, just to talk about that, that is being essentially a necessary evil that is being considered at the moment. 
And no, as you know, I've, I've said this before, the Super Hornet and the Growler have not yet been confirmed as ordered by the German government. They have only issued like a statement of intent that they're interested in it. They have not yet ordered these planes, as you know, but it's just worthwhile mentioning it once again. Nothing has changed in that uh, position. The reason why uh, the Super Hornet and Growler is of course being considered at the moment is, well, Super Hornet would give the Germans a strike package and as well as that, the Growler gives them the electronic warfare platform and you have that synergy between these two aircraft because essentially they're built from the same platform and at the same time, they also tick all the boxes that Germany needs, including to carry the American nuclear uh, B-61 bomb. So with all of that summed up, I just want to remind you that I also recently did an Inside the Cockpit episode on a Panavia Tornado. I deep dive into the cockpit, explain you the system, explain you the layout, and also the history of the platform. So if you have not yet seen that video, check it out as well. That will give you a nice little introduction to the actual aircraft, and you will also see the inside of it, which is something that most people don't really get to see. Now, I'm going to be starting here from um, in this graph, as I said, I'm going to start from the bottom, going to the top, and I'm going to focus on the main aspects of why these planes might not work or could work. But since I am restricting myself to the main aspects, I can't talk about everything. If you have anything to add to the discussion, please put it in the comment section below. I'd be very interested to read all your ideas as well. So let's start with the first one, which is the F-16. Who doesn't love the F-16, right? Yeah, that's not going to happen. So it does not really have an electronic warfare platform. Yes, there are certain elements of that, I believe in Block 50, and now there's been recent use, news, not use, uh, for Block 70 and 72, that then uh, electronic warfare package is being added and upgraded. But unlike the FA-18 Super Hornet and Growler combo, you are not really getting that much value out of the platform. Uh, Super Hornet and Growler would probably be the better options because you have a better strike package and also the electronic warfare suite is already available. Um, that being said, it is going to be interesting to see what F-16 is going to uh, mature into. Well, it has already matured as a platform, but where it is going. But I just want to remind all of us, um, including myself, that when we talk about acquiring a new plane, we also should think about everything that comes with that plane around it. For example, I'm gonna talk about the weapon systems here. Currently, what the Luftwaffe uses are weapon systems that are integral to Eurofighter and Tornado. If they now acquire a different plane from a different country with different weapon systems, they might have to certify their own weapons on this platform, which is going to take time, which plus it's a huge information exchange, which is sometimes a bit awkward. And, or they take all the weapon systems that already come with that platform and add it to the package and import that into the force. So it's when we think about acquiring a new plane, just thinking about the weapons here as well, it's not just the plane, it's everything that comes with the plane and weapon systems only being one part of that, but that shows you how really big this issue actually is. It, it grows beyond just acquiring a new aircraft. Next, next suggestion here is the uh, BAE Tempest. So Tempest doesn't exist yet and uh, Germany needs something now, not in you know, 30 years time. Besides Germany themselves are with Airbus in collaboration with Dassault and of course uh, the Spanish uh, companies as well. Uh, working on their own sixth generation platform, which is a direct competitor to Tempest, and that is called FCAS or SCAF if you're uh, French. And so, as, as much as I would like European countries to bundle together, share expertise, and build one sixth generation platform that works for all of them, that is incredibly difficult. We've seen this in the past. Yes, Panavia Tornado is one of the examples where multilateral uh, development of a weapon system has worked. There's a couple of other examples as well, but for every example there, there's also two or three where this hasn't worked. And it's going to be incredibly difficult for European countries like France, Germany, Britain, Spain, Italy, even Sweden, to come up with one combined solution that fits all of them without having to compromise heavily on what each individual country wants. And I don't just see it happening at this point. So I would like to see it happening, but it's not. But that being said, you know, Tempest is, uh, as we say in Germany, Zukunftsmusik, music of the future, just as FCAS. So right now, not a valuable option, but it's going to be interesting to see where that platform uh, develops into. Now we come to the uh, the J-20, the FC-31 and Chinese aircraft in a whole. Now I'm not going to make qualitative statements about Chinese aircraft. The reason is that I've recently invited an expert on this subject 
onto the channel. I've made an interview with him and he's going to introduce you and me to the capabilities of, as far as we know in the West, of the current Chinese kit that is out there. So wait for that uh, video to, to get a deep dive on that. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. What I'm going to do at this point is just remind us all that buying a military jet is not like buying apples at a supermarket. I know you know that, but even for myself, sometimes it's something that is important to remember because once we talk about these what if scenarios, it's very easy to get carried away and just come up with options that once you start deep diving into them really are not that realistic. And this is exactly this, uh, this uh, issue here with the Chinese plane. So military procurement is a very political process, even geopolitical, and it goes into national security. And when we look at the Chinese jets, I mean, there's going to be information exchange between the Germans and the Chinese aircraft. And that's going to, you know, be quite difficult because it touches on things like military capabilities, of course, obvious, uh, intelligence, and looking at the Chinese side, uh, side, you know, the Chinese are not going to sell Germany a jet. They're certainly not going to sell them the Mighty Dragon, the J-20, but they're not going to sell them any other jet either because they know that Germany is a NATO. They know that Germany has very tight ties with NATO allies with America and they are quite rightfully probably going to fear that if Germany gets these jets that the capabilities of these jets will trickle down information wise towards the allies especially the Americans and that is something that China wants to avoid and at the same time flip side let's look at this from the other side right Germany is not going to buy a Chinese jet because Germany I'm going to use the the royal we yes and the royal third person here um Germany, we have better allies. China is not an ally of Germany. Yeah, we have allies in NATO. We have allies in Europe. We have allies in America with Canada. We have tighter ties and, and, and nations that we trust more and who also have military kit that is quite more potent of what the Chinese are bringing out, right? That is just easier to acquire, comes with less strings attached, comes with less risk attached and makes a lot more sense. So. Um, yeah, this is this is one of those things uh, where it's it's just not possible from from a political geopolitical perspective. New drones, drone swarms unmanned. This is a really cool suggestion because it's very future orientated, right? But uh, just a reminder: Germany needs something now. And when I say now, okay, next next five years, let's say, not in fifteen to twenty years time. Now, yes. Drones are really sort of the, the topic that we like to discuss at the moment. They're very, very pertinent to ongoing discussions about where aviation, military aviation is taking us in the future. But again, a lot of this stuff, you're not going to take a drone, right? A normal weaponized drone as we know, like the Heron TP or something like the older platforms like the Predator or something. And you're going to say, well, we're going to just take that and replace all our force with that. Of course, I don't think that has been the suggestion that you guys have been making anyway. But when we think about drone swarms and so on, that is planned in FCAS anyway. And that is also planned, for example, in Tempest, although a little bit less so. So a lot of these capabilities are only just now being hashed out what they're supposed to be and what they're going to be. And there is a lot of theoretical stuff and a very little practical stuff when it comes to drone swarming. So we're not yet there where we can really make a decision on this. Plus, I mean, if you've seen the German debate on weaponized drones, I have a video on this with Dr. Ulrike Franke. She gives a great, really a fantastic breakdown of the German drone debate on weaponized drones and why it's so complex. And if you've seen that video, you'll know why this currently is not an option for Germany anyway. The next one is an F-22, the F-22. I mean, at this point, you might as well go F-35. I know I've, all these, these comments come on a video where I said Germany does, doesn't buy the F-35, right? So, but thinking about the platform and the, F, uh, the F-22, here we have one. But wait, if, if you're interested in these models, I'm affiliated with Air Models. And if you uh, acquire a fantastic little miniature from them, you will also be supporting the channel. So if that is something that you would like to spice up your living space with, uh, let's say your living room, um, you can do so there and you'll also be supporting the channel. But going back to the F-22, I mean, I, think, I don't think there's been a single F-22 that has been built since what, 2012. And there's been a recent study that was conducted on what it would cost 
to relaunch production of the F-22 because a lot of the factories were sort of mothballed or pushed into um, supporting the production of F-35. I believe the figure that the study comes up with is $10 billion just to relaunch production, not actually a production run of aircraft as well. The cost of those airframes is going to be on top of those $10 billion. And Germany, for a fleet of 40 to 50 aircraft plus 15 ECRs, let's say, uh, they're not going to be spending $10 billion giving it to the Americans plus the cost of the individual airframes. They're going to take that money. They're going to invest it into Eurofighter. They're going to invest it into either maybe Super Hornet or into FCAS or well any, any, any other project. The F-22 um, doesn't work at this point. Um, you might just go with completely different options. The option of buying F-22 secondhand, also not very good. You know, it's a dead end at this point. So Tornado new or updated, um, I think what is meant here is either you update the existing airframes or you buy new ones, build new ones. On the side of updating them, well that's what Germany has been doing together with their partners, the RAF and the Italians on the platform. Of course the RAF has recently, well, retired their Tornado fleet. Um, that was a very um, sad ceremony, but yeah, the platform is getting old, right? Um, so they have been doing that for some time and they've been giving midlife updates and I believe it is slotted to fly until 2030 and then 2035 even and we're not quite sure yet where, how long uh, Tornado is going to stay with it. But one thing is sure, Tornado is over. It is an old platform and there's only so much you can do with it. And just like with the F-22 relaunching production now just for Germany is going to be prohibitive uh, expensive based on what you're gaining out of it. So that just doesn't make any sense at this point. I would hate to see Tornado go, but we will have to let it go at some point. It's just, it's just how it is. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure if there's any big update for Tornado slotted up at the moment, uh, but there's not so much that you can do anyway at this point anymore. The next option, FA-18, where do we have mine? There it is, FA-18. Uh, I was a little bit surprised how low this was on the list, to be honest, um, given that this is actually one of the planes that is realistically being considered by the German government. And at this point, I'm not going to be saying that it is a good option, in my opinion, but it is a realistic option. You can, of course, have a discussion whether uh, Super Hornet and Growler gives Germany the capabilities that will allow it to overcome the hopefully never scenarios that we sadly have to include in sort of this planning and hopefully never scenarios would be a direct confrontation with uh, well, the Russians, at least if we only think about Europe, right? Russian air force, Russian air defenses, especially the air defenses. And you can make an argument, well, you know, the Russians have been beefing up those capabilities as well. Is Super Hornet and Crowder really going to work in that environment? I'm not the one that can answer this question, I'm gonna be honest, but that is an argument that I think we should look at. Super Hornet, of course, has some uh, advantages. It's relatively easy to acquire. I can already hear somebody typing. Just stand by for one second. Um, it's relatively affordable as well. I can hear somebody else now typing. Please just stand by for a second. And of course, it comes with that combined synergetic package, which is the Super Hornet and Growler. And I don't think anybody's typing there. To loop back to recent news, that's why I was saying that some people might already be typing, is that well, there's been recent news now with the 2022 uh, proposed uh, defense, uh, Department of Defense budget by the US. And in that budget, the FA-18 uh, acquisitions for 2020 have been slashed to zero. None whatsoever. Null of Deutsch. Yeah. Actually, uh, Steve Trimble on Twitter put together this handy graph here that you can see. And uh, give him a follow, by the way, uh, if you're interested in these sort of questions. He often posts quite interesting things on such topics. And what this means is that Germany better decide fast whether they want Super Hornets and Growlers or not. Because with the US Navy slashing their orders, it's going to get more expensive buying the platform. And eventually it might not longer be available because you might say, well, Boeing could go out on a limb here and build a couple of white tails on their own company money in the hopes of selling those then later on to Germany. But I don't see Boeing taking that risk at the moment. So yeah, it's now or never uh, Germany. If you want Super Hornets or Growlers, you better decide this year or mm, next year, maybe. And this once again shows you how time sensitive these things are. 
and we really should have started this whole process 10 to 20 years ago. But, oh well, you know, that's in the past. We just got to move forward now. Next one, F15EX. Might as well just keep Tornado and try to improve it at this point. Um, Rafale. Okay, so now it gets interesting. The sweetheart of the internet has arrived. It is so Rafale. Rue the day anybody on the internet criticizes the Rafale. Rafale is not a good option. Yeah, there. I gone and said it. It's not a good option. The reason why I say that, I'm going to focus on the political side now. Of course, Rafale is a capable aircraft. It comes with a strike package. It has a competitive electronic warfare suite. But what I want to just highlight here is that currently Dassault, which of course builds Rafale, and Airbus, which is part of the conglomerate that builds Eurofighter, they are working together on FCAS. And right now, they're a little bit of a clinch yeah, about who gets to say what on FCAS. Yeah, the French are very interested in the new next generation fighters or the fighter platform in FCAS, and the Germans, the Airbus, um, uh, the Airbus company is mainly working on, of course, the remote carrier, but they also want to have the say on the next generation fighter. And right now, it's a little bit complicated between those two sides. And the last thing, that I think Airbus wants at this point, Airbus wants generally, but at this point specifically, is that the German government turns around to that zone and says, we want Rafale, we're going to prop you up, instead of buying more Eurofighters from Airbus. That is certainly going to see some, some heavy lobbying on the side of Airbus right now. But at the same time, we also have to think about it beyond that in the political, geopolitical realm. Germany is, of course, in NATO's nuclear sharing policy, which means they're using the B-61 nuclear bomb, which is an American bomb. Now, say in this hypothetical scenario that they buy Rafale and they want to certify Rafale for the B-61 nuclear bomb. Now the French are going to say no, because when that happens, a lot of information exchange between the two platforms is essentially being sent the Americans' way. And I don't think, the French are you know, tight allies with the Americans, but they still don't want the top of the line information on their fighter platform being sent towards the Americans. And there's going to be a lot of information exchange on these two platforms in order to certify the aircraft uh, for this bomb. And the French are going to say no, and quite rightly, I think. And then, of course, at that point, you can say, well, the French have their own tactical nuclear warheads, right? Uh, ASMPA. And Rafale is certified for those. Can't Germany just have those? Well, first of all, if Germany does that, it is now out of NATO's nuclear sharing policy because that is based on the B61. And I don't think that Germany politically wants to be out of NATO's nuclear sharing policy, even though theoretically, at the same time, they might want to do that. It's, it's a very complex situation. Anyway, with ASMPA, the French don't have that many of them, but I, and Franco-German friendship has come a long way since the Second World War. We're, we are as tight as ever. But the French are not going to give Germany a nuclear bomb. End of. I mean, if Germany calls and says, hey, we would like to have Rafale, the scenario will most likely unfold like this. Okay, yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Hey, Jean-Pierre! Jean-Pierre! Les Allemands! Les Allemands, ils veulent acheter Rafale? Ouais! <laughs> Avec ASMPA! Ha <laughs> It's so full, les Allemands! Sukhoi aircraft, MiG aircraft, Russian aircraft. Same story as with the Chinese aircraft. Just refer back to what I said there. F-35. Okay, so these suggestions I, on the recommendation of getting the F-35 were made on a video entitled Why Germany Doesn't Buy the F-35. So, spoiler alert. Of course, your suggestions are absolutely valid. The F-35 is a realistic option. It takes all the boxes. Yes, it's expensive, especially in the long run to run, but so would be an updated Eurofighter uh, electronic warfare suite. Or a completely new suite, by the way. It's not just updated. So, yeah, of course, there, there is discussion there, but Germany, even though this is a realistic option, even though this is perhaps the smartest option at this point, Germany has decided not to go that route. So the suggestion is absolutely valid. Sadly, that is not where we're going at the moment. Okay, now, this is, this, this is going to be a good one. Gripen. Gripen is a really cool aircraft. I'm not surprised to see it on the list, but I'm very surprised to see it this high. And Saab, if you're watching this, you guys are popular. Wow. And yeah, of course, uh, on the new um, Gripen EF, I've been looking at this a little bit more closely. I've been asking a couple of people that know a lot more about this than me. The electronic warfare suite, very competitive. The problem is Gripen 
in a strike roll, not that good. It's a downgrade from Eurofighter. And as well as that, the B-61 nuclear bomb, not an option because the Swedish governmental line is that they are not going to allow exports to other countries if the platform that is being exported is going to be used to deliver nuclear warheads. And if the Germans want to have the B-61 and be in NATO's nuclear sharing policy and want Gripen for this, the Swedish government is not going to make that happen. That's just how it's going to be. Um, of course, you could say, well, the Germans could buy Gripen and then promise the Swedes not to do that and then do it anyway. No, that's not going to happen. You know, that's like a house of cards scenario and which just doesn't work in the real world. Um, of course, one of the possibilities would be to get Gripen only for covering Tornado ECR, but then we're talking about a fleet of 15 to 20 aircraft. Financially wise, it doesn't really make sense. And then we come to FCAS or a new German aircraft or an updated Eurofighter. So I'm going to bundle these into one. New German aircraft, well, that's FCAS. Yes, it's a multilateral development, but that's where we are at the moment. So that's still going to take decades. FCAS was moved to what? 2030, then 2040. And we're still not quite sure what FCAS is going to be delivering at the end, if even it happens in the end. So we don't know. Zukunftsmusik, just like Tempest, right? Actually, talking about FCAS, I have uh, Dr. Ulrike Franke coming back to the channel very soon to talk about this platform. And she gives a really nice introduction to this aircraft. And uh, I think a lot of you will, uh, will enjoy that uh, video. So make sure you subscribe and hit the bell notification so you get the notification when it comes out. And talking then about Eurofighter. Okay, so I have a couple of things to say about this that I've already said in the last video. But... Tornado ECR, again, it's not called ECR because it doesn't exist yet, but the electronic warfare uh, variant that is proposed by Airbus is going to be really expensive for Germany to do. But also because Germany is probably going to be only country to buy it. And again, this is going to be like for 15, 20 planes until we see a massive increase in the size of the Luftwaffe, which I don't see forthcoming in the near future. And also Eurofighter ECR is going to still take a while to develop as well. So it's not gonna be around anytime soon. Which again, it shows you that really awkward scenario and why we've ended up with these two possible options. You know, propping up national industry with Airbus in re reordering, first of all, a lot of new uh, Eurofighters in a swing roll for ground attack, for ground strike missions to replace the Tornado IDS, so we're talking about 40 to 50 aircraft, and as well as that, getting Airbus that contract for an updated Eurofighter with electronic warfare. That's one option, and why we, and because this is expensive and still something that has to happen in the long term, Germany has turned to an option that is probably easier to acquire, which is the Super Hornet Growler combo. And this is how we arrive at those two platforms, because the F-35, which is the other realistic option, has been just bracketed off by the previous defense minister. So yeah, you can see the awkward spot that Germany is in at the moment. Um, a lot of the options that you guys have been given me, absolutely valid. They, they could work, theoretically speaking, but there are certain elements in each or in one of them that just disqualify them. And that that just is where the story ends at this point. You know, We'll have to see what Annegret kamp karrenbauer and the Defense Ministry and the German government decides. I don't think that's going to happen this year because this year is election year. So the decision is going to happen in the proposed budget for the year after. So that's the proposal comes in around August, September 2022 and is then ratified in November, December 2022. So yeah, we're going to have to wait at least one and a half years unless something big happens. I don't see that happening at the moment. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. I think the, uh, the CDU, so the party of Annegret Kampanbauer, is currently also um, building up their election program where some of these questions might be answered. We'll have to see. But yeah, I hope that all of you enjoyed this overview of the options that Germany has and this dilemma that we are in. Isn't it fantastic? Absolutely amazing, the situation we've got ourselves in. But yeah, it is how it is. Life goes on, right? I want to hear now your suggestions, your tags, your deep dives on some of these aircraft, why you think they would work for Germany or not. What do you think Germany should be doing at the moment? Put them in the comment section. I'd be very interested to see what all of you would argue. 
And as always, I just want to remind all of you that this channel is actively supported and possible due to active Patreon supporters and channel supporters. So if you enjoy this sort of content, check out those platforms. And if you're so inclined, support the channel. As always, make sure you also like, subscribe, the whole YouTube combo jumbo thing, right? And I wish all of you a fantastic day and see you in the sky.